The video game controller, an iconic piece of technology used by millions and millions of people every single day. These things are a great way to play almost any genre of game. But to be honest with you, they're kind of boring. Controllers nowadays all share basically the same design. This Xbox controller here, the PlayStation 5 controller, and the Switch Pro controllers are all pretty much the same shape, they've got vaguely the same buttons, and it all comes down to the build quality and the ergonomics when deciding which is the best one. It's the Xbox controller by the way. But it wasn't always like this. Back in the good old days, when no one had a clue what a controller was supposed to look like, we got some absolute gems. From the square, sharp, tiny, awful to hold controllers of the NES and the Master System to the larger offering from the OG Xbox and the Duke. And of course, the N64 controller, which was famously designed for people with three hands. And then there's the novelty ones, the ones that were trying to be different. The most famous example of this is the Nintendo Wii. This beauty with its Wiimo and nunchuck offered something completely different and allowed you to adapt your controller to the game you were playing with attachments such as the tennis racket, a steering wheel, a gun, a bowling ball, the cooking mama utensils, some wings, and a baby. Like, really, they were just trying to see how far they could push these things. But they weren't the only ones. One of my favorite controllers of all time is the Resident Evil 4 chainsaw controller. It's nowhere near the best option for comfort or anything really, but the absurdity of carrying a mini chainsaw while fighting through a Spanish village really is the best way to play. So I thought, why not give it a go myself? Why don't I make a controller for my own game that's way worse than just using a regular one, but makes it more fun? I've recently been playing around with some electronics and circuitry, especially for my shiny hunting bot in this video. Part two coming soon, by the way. And I am having a blast making the most scuffed systems that I can. And while walking around the Scottish Highlands, I came up with a few ideas. The first is to create a physical controller for a game idea that I had a few years ago. The game is a simple tower defense where you have five fixed towers, but you only have the power for two of them. And you have to move the batteries around to turn them on when the enemies are close. Originally, I saw this as an Overcooked style co-op game where you have to constantly run around and work together to place the batteries, which I think sounds quite fun. So how do I even make this? Well, I need to make a game in Unity. I need to make a board with a circuit that has five inputs and I need to make the circuit be able to send signals to Unity. And I want to get this project done fairly quickly. Yeah, that seems plausible. So let's start with the circuit. I need to find a way to send the signals to my PC as if it was a keyboard or controller. The good news is that Arduinos can be used for this exact purpose. By plugging them into the USB port, you can get them to be recognized as a generic input device. The bad news is this really only works for the Arduino Leonardo boards, the micros and a few others, none of which I own. So I guess I have to wait for Amazon to arrive. Okay, now I've got a micro board and a Leonardo on the way, I need a simple controller to test out how the inputs actually work. And so, I have these PCB prototype boards and these lovely Cherry MX purples by the glasses company. But the only problem is that they have these little plastic legs on them to go into a regular keyboard. If only there was a solution to this. Oh, sorry glasses. There we go. I got all five switches perfectly soldered onto the board. Yep, yeah, that's looking clean enough. And with some cables and a basic circuit, I can now play the best game on the market, Turn On Some Lights Simulator 2025. So now, if I connect this board to the Arduino with one end of each switch going into a digital pin, I've got them in pins two to six here, and the other end to ground, I can read the signal from each pin to see if I've pressed one of the buttons. And combining this with the keyboard library, I can write key presses to the PC as if it came from a normal keyboard. You can also give it lists of commands, mouse button inputs, and all sorts, meaning you could create a macro pad to do whatever you want with a setup like this. Now then, let's take a look at what I'm actually going to be controlling. This is the Unity game that I'm making for this project. It's a super simple tower defense game, like I said, with assets ripped straight from a Cinti Studios pack. I've set up a simple level here where the enemies just come from the top, make their way around the map, and leave at the bottom, dealing one damage if they do so. There's five turrets placed around the map in vaguely even spacing, so they all watch one area, and are all inactive. They only start searching for targets and shooting when their respective number key is held down. So one, two, three, four, and five. 
This is all very simple and done through the input manager. I simply call an event to toggle the tower, read which number was pressed, and then activate or deactivate it based on if the callback context is performed or cancelled, meaning pressed down or released. But as the controller I'm going to make can only have two held down at once, if you were to just press your keyboard and hold down all five, they explode and short out for a bit, meaning they have to wait a few seconds before being active again. So no cheating. And that's basically it for the game. It's not the main focus of this project, so I thought I'd keep it short. Let's get back to some circuitry. To make things a little nicer and with a more modular approach, I'm going to build a little circuit on this perf board that has headers for the 10 input wires and deals with the resistors and ground line and whatnot so that I can easily swap out the controls for any five button circuit that I like. Using these little headers and cutting them to size, I can solder them to the board so that the Arduino can be easily added in a clean, removable way. Because I do plan to use this for a lot more projects, but if I ever want to go back to this, I'd have to remember which pin is which, but this way I can simply slot it in the top and it just works. And here it is. Ignore how shoddy the solder job is, my soldering iron is really awful, but the important part is it works. I've got these grey wires going from each of the pins on the Arduino to the positive side for the buttons, and then a 10k resistor on the ground side, connecting to the ground pin through this lovely bit of soldering. So now I can just connect this test board up like that, it's ready to go, and means that I can now plug in different buttons instead and get the same result. So let's design these custom buttons. I want to make a controller of sorts that has five slots for an item and when you place the item into the slot it triggers the button press. For this mechanism I've got three ideas that I think are plausible but then I have to figure out how they actually work. The first is by looking at real controllers and the way button presses occur in these. For most controllers they use a plastic button that presses down onto a membrane layer that has a conductive contact on the underside which then bridges two sides of a pad on the circuit board. These pads usually use an intertwined pattern that ensures that the pad is able to be bridged easily. Take a look at this Xbox controller for example. You can see here this wavy pad and that's the two sides of the B button's connection. And on the underside is the membrane pad that connects the two down. So if you push these together, you've got a button press. So I would need to embed a small metal pad on two sides, stick something conductive on the underside of the battery item and then run the wires out the back to the controller. This is very doable, but I think to get this done nicely, I would need to print out custom PCBs or find a small PCB online that is just a single controller pad and have the corresponding membrane part of it to go with it, which would be very nice to do, but I don't think it's worth the cost for this project. So let's look at the other options. The second one I had was by using these pogo pins I have. I got these for a different project, but they could work here. These are commonly found on earbud or smartwatch chargers and are just designed to press down on metal contacts similar to the membrane pads but I can use them to press down on a blob of solder on a perf board instead which is a lot cheaper and easier to make. The biggest problem with these is that I would again probably need a custom PCB but this time for the battery side which connects the two pogo pins together. I did try to solder two pins to these little breadboard jumper wires in an extremely janky fashion but I just couldn't get them to stick nicely and I would have to build a housing for them so they stay in place and line up properly so I abandoned that. The third and honestly the easiest option is the one I've already got in place. Just use the cherry switches again. By building a lego frame that holds the switch in place and has a slot for a second item to press into, activating the switch, I can create a controller exactly like the one I picture in my head. Here's a quick example of how I can do this. I've soldered some switches to these three long perf boards and wired them up. And by using this sloped Lego piece, I can slide this item into the frame I built, which gradually presses down onto the switch. And if I build a frame around the PCB to hold it in place, it works perfectly. Here you can see when the item is inserted, it spams the one key. And when I remove it, it stops. Great. Now I just need to build a structure to house all of the switches. And for that, I'm going to use Bricklink Studio, which is a CAD tool for Lego. So I'm going to design that now. I'll be right back. Okay, and here it is all designed. I measured out the switches spacing in studs. And now I just need to build this. The problem is I don't have these pieces lying around, which is why I use Studio in the first place. So now I have to get the parts list for this and order it off of Lego's pick a brick. So I'll see you when that has arrived. And here we are, the controller. In each of these five slots, you can see the keyboard switch inside. 
held in place by the frame. And at the back, the cable holes for each of the switches individually. And if I place these bricks in, they push down on the switch. So let's give the game a go with my brand new controller. Here we go, starting things off by placing the bricks into slots 1 and 4, because that's where the enemies come from. They'll start to take out the first tanks coming through there. Okay, the spawns are all on the right side, so I'll just use 5 instead, let them come through. The ones on the left have to go all the way around, so they're fine for now. Okay, now load up three in the middle. This is actually way more intense than I thought it would be. I'm really happy with this design. And there we go, a Lego controller. This design is more proof of concept than an actual controller, but it functions exactly how I imagined and is something different than your usual game dev video. And you can push this as far as you like. Imagine a Lego video game with a real life build of the level and minifigs that when placed in certain spots, interact with them in the virtual scene. This mixed reality interaction is what's really fascinating to me, and it's been a blast to play around with. But let me know what you think of it in the comments below. I've got a few more of these controller type videos coming up, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss them, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. I overshot the bed there.